Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to Ship Happens in World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. So, this is the video that you end up watching when something interesting, amusing, or just downright ridiculous happens during the course of a game of World of Warships. Uh, something that would be amusing for people to see, but the actual overall battle itself isn't that remarkable. Or maybe the battle's good, but it only lasts seven or eight minutes and isn't really long enough to carry an entire video. For those occasions, the ship happens. This is Unknown Source in the German Tier 6 destroyer, the Gader. He's in a Tier 7 domination battle here on the neighbour's map. So, not top tier, not bottom tier. It's not exactly the sweet spot, but it could be a lot worse. On the bright side, there are no aircraft carriers and only one submarine. On top of that, there are only three cruisers per side, and down here at Tier 6 and 7, there are not that many radar cruisers around. In fact, there are none in this game, so the cruiser threat is minimal. There is no air threat, there's only one submarine to outspot him, and both teams have lots of big, fat, stupid battleships just begging to be torpedoed. In other words, it doesn't really get much better for a destroyer captain than this. None of that is going to be important today, however, because pretty much everything that Unknown Source is going to run into during the course of this very short battle are other destroyers and cruisers. So we're going to skip ahead to when the shooting starts. One enemy has already been spotted, it's a cruiser, and other enemy ships are starting to get lit up. In fact, there we go. First contact, very close range, enemy Nicholas. A very capable tier 5 American destroyer. You don't really want to be getting into a gunfight with one of these if you can help it. Not that the guider is bad in a gunfight, but it's way too much like a fair fight. For my liking, plus there's an Omaha and an Emile Bertan back there that the Nicholas is spotting for. Fortunately, the Nicholas doesn't want to get into a gunfight here either, so he pops his smokescreen. And he, of course, was the one spotting unknown source. There's the Nicholas torpedo. He's gotten his torpedoes away as well, of course. He's popped his own smoke, which he probably didn't actually need to use now that the Nicholas has chosen to blind itself, but hey, better safe than sorry. Technically, Unknown Source has done the same thing to himself by popping his own smoke, but there is an Omaha and an Undyne with him who are spotting from outside the smoke screen. The Nicholas, with no vision of anything in front, pops out of the smoke and then hastily retreats back into it in order to try to get some vision of what's right in front of him. It's going to cost him some health, though. There's a brief exchange of casualties as the enemy Renown kills that friendly Omaha, but is then immediately sunk in turn by the friendly Kamikaze R's torpedoes. Unknown Source abandons his smokescreen in order to push forward and continue to keep up the pressure not just on the uh, enemy submarine there, but also this enemy Nicholas. I'm not quite sure why the Nicholas isn't firing. I mean, you're spotted anyway. It's not like you have to worry about the smoke firing penalty. And we know you've just... Oh dear. Well, that's taken care of that. The enemy cachalot is still lurking uncomfortably close though, and Unknown Source is spotted probably by the enemy submarine at periscope depth, and it's not a good idea to be sitting in front of all of those cruisers stationary in the water trying to pick up the submarine, so he immediately guns the engine and starts making Billy big steps out of there. While he's desperately trying to evade all of the lead currently being slung at him, just take a quick look at the minimap down here at Cap Circle Alpha. Unknown Source and the Undyne over there are basically contesting this Cap Circle against Seven enemies. More than half the enemy team. I'm not saying that it's necessarily a bad idea to concentrate more than half of your team's resources on one cap point, but I am saying that if you're going to do that, you'd better damn well take it. And as you can quite plainly see, they, uh, they haven't. And it's cost them so far four ships in order to not take any of these cap circles. And it's just cost them five. There goes the Omaha. They've only between them managed to sink a single one of Unknown Source's teammates. And they've just lost another ship. And they're now down to 25 points. Oh, they managed to get a kill back. They're back up to 60 points. Here comes the big fight back. This is the moment where the enemy team rally. Where they get their act together, they dig in, 
they start making oh perhaps not <laughs> <laughs> Zero points in what took from about the time that the shooting started about three minutes. Three minutes and a couple of seconds of actual fighting. Zero points, seven casualties, game over. That's pretty impressive. Our second battle in today's video is a mostly tier 9 domination battle here on the Greece map. And it's starring... How the hell do you pronounce... Serv Servaina Karkul... You know what, I'm, there's no way I'm going to get that right consistently, or maybe even ever, uh, during the course of the remainder of this video. So welcome back Dave, it's been a while. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, it's Dave. Everybody loves Dave. And uh, everybody loves the ship he's sailing today as well, the Prince Ruprecht. This is a very, very popular ship for lots of very, very good reasons. I mean, this ship has been featured so often, it, it barely needs an introduction anymore. But, you know, for the sake of completeness, I suppose I should at least try to give it one short version. It's a battle cruiser, not a battleship. German battleships are known for being as tough as old boots. Not the battle cruisers. They really don't like getting shot at. They definitely can't weather the storm the way an actual battleship can. But holy cow, these things are powerful. They very much fit the definition of a glass cannon. They can dish it out, but they really don't like taking it. This ship is armed with eight 16-inch guns. And she benefits from having cruiser dispersion, which makes her... One of the more accurate battleships out there, even though her Sigma rating isn't particularly good. She also has 16 twin 150 and 105mm secondaries with very good range, good accuracy and a pretty impressive rate of fire too. Generally speaking, German battleship captains tend to go for secondary builds because German secondaries are so good and that's true on the battle cruisers as well, particularly the Prinz Ruprecht here at Tier 9. And as if all of that wasn't enough, she also gets torpedoes. And she's fast as well. I mean, German battleships tend to be quite quick, particularly once you get up to the higher tiers. But this ship is quick, with a top speed of 32 knots, and without all of that nasty heavy armour weighing her down, she responds reasonably well to throttle commands in the way that very heavily armoured German battleships like the Bismarck, the Frederick the Great and the Grosser Kurfürst really don't. I mean, I'm not trying to claim that she has cruiser mobility and manoeuvrability to go with her cruiser accuracy, but she's, she's fairly nimble where it counts. First enemy spotted, at least as far as Dave's concerned, with the Pommen. We've had this before, actually. Showdown between a Pommen and a Prinz Ruprecht. Uh, my money would go on the Pommen. Because even though it doesn't have as powerful a main armament, it's armed with 15 rather than the 16 inch guns that the Prinz Ruprecht enjoys, it has actual armour. Its secondaries are just as good. It also has torpedoes, so it's not even like the Prinz Ruprecht can win the fight decisively by closing in and torpedoing it, because the Pommen can do that right back. But it's got armour. It can take hits from those 16-inch guns in the way that the Prince Ruprecht really doesn't want to be taking hits from the Pommen's 15-inch guns, or, for that matter, the Pommen's secondaries. So Dave, because it's not just the Pommen over there, of course, oh, hello, a cruiser poking out from behind an island in, oh, come on, <laughs> how did he survive that? It's not like he even needed to poke out either, it's a talent, it's got radar, hide behind the island, and use your radar. He's not even using his radar. Oh, one of those torpedoes is looking good. I mean, Dave's detected, but it's by Hydro. The Talon wasn't even shooting. I don't understand why he popped out. I mean, I'm not complaining. <laughs> I, mean, I just don't see the point. Oh, Dave's team suffered the first casualty. Friendly Kagero has gone down. Dave's going to need to be really careful here. I mean, he's got a Talon, a Pommen, a Frederick the Great, and a Z-46 on the other side of this island. It's probably the Z-46's Hydro that was lighting him up. He's gone undetected now, of course, because the Talon doesn't seem to realise that it's a radar cruiser. <laughs> he's 
keeping an eye on the other side of the island here for any pesky destroyers popping up. He's got his secondaries focused on the pommon, and he's been spotted. Well, it's not the Talon, it's definitely not the pommon because he's inside a smoke screen. Oh, I think it was the Frederick the Great. Certainly wasn't the Z46, he has no line of sight. All right. Time to duck back into the cover of the island here because now you're getting focused by two sets of very strong German secondaries, although it looks like the Pommon is about to go down. Let's hope so. Oh, Z46, what do you think you're doing? I see you there. Bad destroyer. No, back off. I'll say this much for the Z46 as the Pommon goes down. He does at least wait for Dave's Hydro to expire before trying anything. He goes undetected and then immediately reveals himself by firing his guns. I'm not really seeing the point of that. Likewise the Talon, who is still lurking behind the island over there. Now whether it's through luck or judgement, because Dave isn't spotted until he backs up and starts getting the secondaries firing, but he picks that exact moment to make his move. Now he's quite safe from Dave's main battery guns, who aren't going to clear that spit of land, and he didn't have them turned around in time anyway, as he gets ready to launch some torpedoes against the Frederick the Great over there. But the Talon's made it, even though he still doesn't realise he's a radar cruiser, and could have timed that using actual judgement if he popped his radar first. He's gotten his torpedoes away, but they're clearly not going to hit Dave. He might have launched them at the ships behind him, but with the torpedoes passing that close to Dave, they're not going to come as a surprise to anybody. These torpedoes are, however, going to come as a big surprise to the Z-46 who does at least, completely unintentionally, warn the Frederick the Great that they were coming by virtue of taking one of them in his face. I'm just saying, if you have Hydro and you're attacking a target that you know has torpedoes, maybe use the Hydro. That way things like that won't come as a nasty surprise. So the Frederick the Great has taken at least one torpedo, is flooding and is in trouble. And now, after he's been torpedoed, he uses his Hydro. The Talon still doesn't know that he's a radar cruiser. <laughs> he's caught in open water, <laughs> just begging to be finished by these 16-inch armor-piercing shells. There it is. The Frederick the Great succumbs to the flood. There's the double strike, which just... Is the Z-46 still out there? I'm seeing a smoke screen. Oh, no, no, the Alsace got him. <laughs> well, good job. So, after almost precisely seven minutes of battle, Dave's team do have a three-kill advantage, they do have a points lead, but they only still have the one cap circle that they actually started the battle with. Oh, enemy Izumo. Now, like the Prince Ruprecht, the Izumo is a very powerful but not particularly tough ship, even though it's a battleship and not a battle cruiser. But it absolutely should not be given broadside to anything armed with 16-inch guns at that or any kind of range. That was a bit of a paddling, as well as being Dave's third kill. The enemy team are behind by 300 points, but they still have three of the cap circles. Now at this point you have to ask yourself, what is the best thing to do? Because that cap circle all the way up there at Charlie is now basically completely undefended, and the team could probably use a couple of cap circles, because they still only have the one that they started the battle with. But the enemy team are also uh, quite significantly on the back foot here. They've only managed to inflict two casualties, two destroyers, and they've lost six ships of their own. So maybe it's worthwhile keeping the pressure up. The friendly Rook who's with them appears to be heading north for the cap circle. Uh, there's a friendly destroyer who's way too far out of position to do anything other than maybe assist the Rook in taking the cap. So Dave figures, ah, screw it. Chicks dig scars and glory lasts forever. Let's go for it. Oh, and he's got the broadside of a Neptune to shoot at. This could go one or two ways. You're either going to obliterate him, or all of these shots are just going to overpenetrate. And it looks like they all just overpenetrated. The Neptune returns fire. Sure, he's given broadsides of the Neptune, but the Neptune's only armed with uh, six-inch guns, not the 16-inch guns. Oh no, he's grounded himself. He tried to angle. <laughs> If he just kept running, he would have made it into cover, but no, he tried to angle away. <laughs> he thought. <laughs> if he hadn't thought, he would have probably survived. 
Although how much longer he would have survived is open to debate because there are now only three enemy ships left. And they're all spotted. Dave here could easily have switched to and sunk the Nagato over there and gotten himself the Kraken Unleashed, but instead he's going for the damage by focusing down the Lion, which honestly, I mean, it's not entirely selfish. It is the best use of his firepower for the team. It's just a happy coincidence that it's also probably the only way he's going to get 200,000 damage out of this game while there's still enemy ships left to shoot at, so it's all good. Everybody's a winner except for the Lion and the Nagato, who is trying to recover some health, but is on fire and is dead. There are now only two enemy ships remaining. The Lion is about to go down. Dave could still get the Kraken. Uh, no, not today. That just leaves that guy, who is right at the extreme limits of Dave's shooting range. I mean, technically he could shoot at him now. And he might hit. I mean, it's a Prince Ruprecht. It gets cruiser accuracy. But Dave wants that Kraken. He also wants the 200,000 damage. He's already got the high caliber for, I think that was a, just about 191, 192,000. It's based on the amount of hit points available on the enemy team, of course. There's no specific amount of damage that you have to score in order to get the high caliber. There's a potential to get both the 200,000 and the Kraken Unleashed here but he's going to have to get a move on. Fortunately, he's in Prince Ruprecht. It's fast. And the Navarin isn't slow, but it's not as fast. I don't know where the Navarin thinks he's going. I mean, there's nowhere to run to, Sunshine. <laughs> you, you can't escape. <laughs> oh, he took a big hit from somebody. It wasn't Dave. Could this be the kill? Yes, there it is. Double strike, Kraken Unleashed, Confederate, high caliber, 200,000 damage done. I do so love it when a plan comes together. Good job, Dave. You got basically exactly everything out of that battle that you wanted to. And as a result of your efforts, top of the team on base experience with more than 2,000. It's customary at this point where I try to salvage some shred of dignity for the enemy team by saying things like, well, you know, it's a shame for the enemy whatever but not in this case. There wasn't a single ship on the enemy team who managed to get more than 800 base experience. Yeah, they didn't exactly cover themselves with glory in that one, but on the bright side, I suppose the best thing I can say is at least it wasn't quite as bad and humiliating as the utter destruction of the enemy team that we saw in the first battle in today's video. That's what we call damned by faint praise. <laughs> anyway, congratulations, Dave. Another great result, but hey, we expect nothing less from you around here. Uh, looking forward to seeing your next appearance. And in the meantime, I hope everybody enjoyed this one. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.